Coming up, why boredom at work and in general is a good thing. And then new data on how most people have an unhealthy relationship with work. We'll cover it all. Let's go. Welcome to the Ken Coleman Show, where we help you win in your work life so that you're winning in other areas of your life. All right. Uh, I come from a generation, uh, Gen X, where we were more bored than the millennials and the Zers. And then, of course, you can, you know, the greatest generation and, and the boomers could say the same thing. And so I really want to dive into this boredom thing. This is fascinating stuff. I've been reading about it. And, uh, and, and so I want to challenge you to really open your mind to this. So if you're one of those people uh, who is, shall we say, obsessed with productivity and you wear hustle like it's an outfit, you know, like it's a superhero thing, it's a badge of honor, then your creativity in general is not what it should be and it probably sucks. And some of you go, well, uh, Got you there, Ken. I am not in a creative role. Not true. Any role at work has a level of creativity to it. No matter who you are, if you think you are not an imaginative at all, you do have an imagination. You are a creative person. And so uh, we're going to talk about creativity and imagination really as a way of thinking and to be at our best in the process of thinking. And boredom is the secret sauce. Now, for those of you who just are on the go, 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 every minute of your day is is just doing or meeting, doing, meeting, and oh my gosh, it's a hamster wheel. Uh, this is a problem. Because most of us working in 2023 in America and certainly around the world are what we would call knowledge workers, which requires that our brains are critical and strategic and creative. In fact, studies have shown that the most valuable leadership competencies over the last 10 to 15 years have been adaptability, innovation, and creativity. So let's look at that. Adaptable, innovative, and creative. That's all about your ability to think. And if we don't understand the role that boredom can play in superpowering our brain, we're, pl we're, we're playing with our hand tied behind our back. Like we're... We're, we're engaged in battle here in work, and, and, and we don't have everything that we could have. So a lot of us are struggling to be our best at being creative. So let me ask you a question. How many of you out there have ever tried to force yourself to be creative? You know what I'm talking about? Like you got to come up with an idea. Maybe it could be as simple as helping your kid out with a school project, uh, or you're at work and you're in a brainstorm meeting, and you're, everybody's driving and you just can't get it, or you're alone writing, or you're strategizing, you're trying to come up with something, and you can't get it and you're just trying to force it, how'd that go? I would suggest it was a pretty frustrating process. So the barrage of busyness is the enemy here. Busy. Busy, 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 busy. We're so freaking proud of how busy we are. We greet each other now with this barrage of busyness, which is now a badge of honor. Hey, Ken, how's it going? Ah, oh, Whew. crazy man i'm trying to catch the tiger by the tail i've said that but before to people and i say it with a little bit of you know hey man i'm you know i got a lot going on oh shut up coleman think about that if that's really true then all that busyness is leaving our brains overstimulated depleted and certainly ill-equipped for the amount of creativity that we need to do a good job. So what is the fix? I've been telling you, you need moments of monotony, boredom. I mean it. Like, find some monotonous moments that allow your brain to get bored and watch out. Now, let me talk about what, now what we are, are talking about here. We're not talking about soul crushing, the feeling of meaninglessness that can just suck the soul or crush the soul where I'm just sitting there and I'm just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Now that is bad boredom. I'm not talking about where you have nothing to do on the job. What I'm talking about is moments 
of monotony. This is where your brain relaxes and goes into default mode, almost autopilot, right? Kind of cruise control. And research shows us that when you go into these moments of monotony and the brain is on cruise control, that the brain now kicks in full, uh, kicks into fifth gear, if you will, when it comes to creativity. It's counterintuitive, I know. But your capacity to brainstorm and problem solve will skyrocket if you have moments of monotony. Now, you've probably heard or read stories where someone was in a moment of monotony and something amazing happened. My favorite is J.K. Rowling, the, the author of Harry Potter, and came up with the idea while staring out the window of a train on her commute. Now, Alex, I got to tell you this. Stacy and I were in Scotland in May, and we were on our way out of Scott Edinburgh to the airport, and our driver said, this neighborhood over to our left is Jake, where J.K. Rowling lived at the time that she began to write this. And I was looking at it, and I could see her riding the train, and I saw the train tracks. And so picture J.K. Rowling just staring out the window and just kind of the clackety-clack, clackety-clack of the, of the train tracks, and she's on her way in. And instead of being on her device, she's staring out the window and essentially turning her brain on cruise control. And that's when she gets the idea. Steve Jobs. Another of the world's great creatives said, boredom allows one to indulge in curiosity. And out of curiosity comes everything. Maybe you've experienced this when you're washing the dishes or doing yard work or folding laundry. Uh, for me, driving uh, on a longer road trip and yard work are my two moments of super creativity. I'm doing something like I'm pulling weeds or I'm trimming bushes blowing with the blower, you know, whatever it is, right? The yard work is famous for me. What's happening is my brain isn't actually engaged in the moment because I know what to do. It's it's just kind of a, here I'm picking this weed and I'm over here and I'm just kind of, right? The brain just kind of slows down. And in slowing down, what happens is the brain begins to stimulate, beginning to pull things that I couldn't pull before because I was so engaged and so busy and moving. So how do we draw a line in the sand to now actually change our life by the way we change our thinking? Take control of your schedule. Take control of your schedule. Stop multitasking. Don't get the brain so stemmed up and so cluttered with so many different activities. Maybe the most important thing, and then the most important thing, and then the most important thing. But how about self-regulating till you go, you know what? I've got a big meeting coming up at 2 o'clock. I'm going to take 30 minutes and just walk around my building. I'm just going to go walk. That doesn't mean screen social media because social media is engaging your brain. I'm talking like you just get up and walk. Go to the gym. And just throw some weights up and let your brain re-engage. How about this? How about the next time you're standing in a line and waiting for something, you don't engage your phone. You just stand there and look around, you know, da, 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 that kind of an attitude. Set aside a few minutes before every meeting. If you can't do a 30-minute walk, do five minutes of away from your computer, away from your phone, and uh, just go outside and stare at a tree. And just force yourself to take a moment, to take a moment to stare at a blank page. That's the exercise. That's really what it is. And, and when we do that, let me tell you what happens. The brain begins to fire and it begins to think about the things that we already care about and matter. And so it's quiet. Quiet the brain. The irony is, is when we quiet the brain, we fire the brain up. And why do we do this? Because the world needs our A game. Your brain is a supercomputer. Let it cool off with moments of monotony and watch what happens. Oh, the ideas are just a moment of monotony away. Give it a try. It's a lot of fun and really peaceful too. This is the Ken Coleman Show.
Welcome back to the Kid Colbert Show. If you are enjoying the show, it is helping you. Would you help me help more people? You can do that by liking the videos that you're watching on YouTube with that thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel and share the videos if you feel they'll help someone. And then if you're listening via podcast, uh, give us a follow, a five-star review, and share as well. All right, so let's. Uh, we've been talking about, uh, just for the last few moments, about the importance of moments of monotony. Well, let's now talk about boredom from another side of things and make sure that we are aware of what's going on. We got another freaking ridiculous trend called a bore out. And this is like burnout, but from boredom. Now, for years, I've taught on five causes of burnout, and one of the causes is boredom. It'll it'll burn you out because you just, you, you have no juice because you don't have any sense of meaning in the work you're doing. Then you start to wonder if you have any meaning. And, and we humans need challenge. We just do. Uh, we need the adventure that comes with challenge. And so when you're bored out of your skull, you can eventually burn out just because you lose, essentially, the juice. Well, now there's a new trend, and this is the word bore out. It is a phenomenon uh, defining chronic boredom. The work is pointless. This is from Peggy Klaus, a communications expert with Klaus & Associates. Uh, the result of bore out, she said, is employee stress, lethargy, or lethargy, low creativity and productivity, and an increase in physical and mental health problems. And that leads to high turnover and early retirement. Now, I was just getting to get irritated when I was reviewing this, guys. And she said what I was thinking. She said, I see bore out and quiet quitting is the same thing. To the degree that employee refuses to do any work outside of the job description, engage in meetings unless directly addressed, or respond to anything uh, unless pressured, this is the bore out and the quiet quitting. Uh, the, now, the demographic, now this is interesting, the demographic in the workplace that most identifies with this concept uh, is males range 18 to 35. And because of the bore out, they're less encumbered by family responsibilities and they're willing to change. And so they'll just move on because they don't really have anything to risk. It's just them. And uh, it's interesting that they spent the least amount of time in an organization. So I think what happens is these 18 to 35-year-old men, you think about it, they've grown up on video games, overstimulation. Men, I think probably more so than women, are a little bit flightier because we got to have that that challenge. You know, you don't see a lot of women doing stupid stuff on the Internet. Isn't that funny? You don't see that a lot, right? You don't see a lot of women going, hey, hold my beer. I'm going to jump off a cliff. It just It's dudes. I mean, if you look at the 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 great proportion of uh, stupid videos, like humans doing stupid things, it's a high percentage of males. And come on, guys, it's the truth. And and, and it, you're looking for adventure, you know. And so I I can do that. I think I'll try that. Don't try this at home. And the average male goes, I'll try it. Don't tell me what I can't try at home. And so this is very interesting. Now, I bring this up to say that being engaged in work and doing work you love is absolutely the aim of the show. I want to help you do it. But, guys, there is a sense of maturity here where sometimes we have to do that boring thing so that we get the opportunity to do the exciting thing. That's a key distinction. I mean, look. There are parts of my day that are boring, but I got to do it so that I can do this exciting stuff. And so that's the idea that we've got to take away. So understand that. Now, uh, switching to another story here in the news headline, most people have an unhealthy relationship with their work. Uh, HP Inc. announced in a groundbreaking study um, that employees' relationship with work around the globe stinks. Duh, we didn't need to spend the money. I could have told you. 15,000-plus respondents across 12 countries in multiple industries were the source of the study. And there is now a false choice between productivity and happiness. And a lot of people feel like, all right, if I'm going to do a good job or have a good job, I can't be happy. I just got to be productive so I keep getting the paycheck. And I think this study is right. Just 27% of knowledge workers say they have a healthy relationship with work. 
Now, the reason that distinction is interesting, because I think a lot of people incorrectly assume that if you are not in a white collar knowledge worker role, like say you're working with your hands, that you're automatically unhappy. And I think that's garbage. Uh, the data doesn't show up here, but again, knowledge workers, you know, they're not doing hard, manual, risky labor. And so that's why this is called out. Just 27% have a healthy relationship with work. Why? My take on this is, is they're tied, they're tethered to technology. I mean, if you work as a carpenter, a bricklayer, um, an electrician, HVAC repair, you, you pick it. And you may work some crazy hours, but once you're done, you leave it. You're not on site and you leave it. The knowledge-based workers is we're always tethered to technology of the email, of the text, of the whatever the inner office chat system is. And so you're never really removed from it unless you decide to put your phone up and or your computer and stop looking at it. And we all have got these habits where we just feel like, well, another email, another email. I got to answer this email. It's awful. Um, this from uh, Lori Gottlieb, a psychotherapist who helped with the study. This is a quote. The most successful companies are built on cultures that enable employees to excel in their careers while thriving outside of work. Yes, but I think she misses a key point. We need to make sure that people are thriving at work. Leaders need to make sure that people are in the right seat of the bus. Um, and if they're not in the right seat, they're in a seat that would get them to the right seat. And the person knows that. And so they've got their eye on the prize and that, they, that, that they're given the tools to do the job that they're in and that they are valued in the office. If we could do that as leaders, people would be thriving in the office, in the work, which gives them a better chance of thriving outside of the office. If they're unhappy at work and they're not thriving, guess what? They're sucking, they're dying, they're complaining, whatever. And they're dragging that into the rest of their life. So there's only so much a company and leadership can do on thriving outside of work. That's why I understand what she's saying. And it's not that I disagree with her. It's just, it's, it's incomplete. We can and should focus first and foremost on helping people thrive at work and be valued while thriving. That is thriving. You can't be doing a good job, but feel like you're devalued and burned out and overworked and everything else. It doesn't work. Over half, 55% of unhappy workers struggle with self-worth and mental health. 59% are too drained to pursue personal passions and 62% struggle maintaining healthy routines. That's where companies can come in. And if you're, if you're as a manager and a leader, you know how your people are doing and you see these numbers and you go, okay, well, we, we got to change your workload. Why are you struggling with self-worth? How are we playing into that? Boy, we need to come in and make sure, you know, you, you matter to us deeply. And, and, and then you're sitting there and you're going, hey, look, how can we help you be happy at work? If you can't do it, then help them move on and value them. But if you can, make it happen. Now, if you aren't in a place where you are happy, you can't just take it. I want you to try to talk to your leader first. HR, talk to them. Got to have a conversation. Don't complain. Just reveal and see what happens. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. You were created to fill a unique role in your work. And if you aren't filling that role, I'm telling you, that's why you feel the way you feel about work. And you can fill in the blank. But if you know what that work is, you can find where that work is. And I've got the ultimate tool. It's our signature product, a measuring tool for self-awareness that allows you to see yourself as that unique person, find that role, and then go get it. It's called the Get Clear Career Assessment. It'll measure what you do best, what you love to do most, and what results motivate you. That is a game changer to know that. You can get it at kencoleman.com slash assessment, kencoleman.com slash assessment. 
All right, to the phones we go. We've got a follow-up coaching call here with Valerie, who joins us in the Atlanta area. Valerie, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, Ken. Thank you so you much for taking my call. I was really down and out when you talked to me back at the end of June, beginning of July. Um, severely underpaid and overworked. And just not making but $16 an hour, and I'm 58 years old and severely financially disabled over everything. If you remember, I had an accident, and I just had not been able to land a full-time job. Sure. So fast forward to um, thank you so much. You gifted me the From Paycheck to Purpose and um, the Proximity Principle, Total Blessings. I read them. I took the career assessment, did exactly what you said to see where I am, which um, – Compassion was my top talent, and it was so weird that everything was right. <laughs> well, you know why? And, because you answered the questions honestly. And so you yeah. we, we were able to just put a mirror in front of you. So that's very exciting. Just trying really hard to learn. Um, and I did what you said, put myself out there. Um, actually went on some Facebook groups, which sounds strange, but I put myself out there. I actually put out there you know, looking for some folks that had taken the Dave Ramsey course and in the same breath, I just wrote this long dissertation about, you know, really needing to find another job. And it, one thing led to another. I got several interviews. One, I was quite shocked and um, it got me down because it was a two and a half hour interview. And then the people that I asked for follow up after I didn't get the job and the guy I would work for, because I met with the CEO and the other person, the ops manager, and the ops manager told me I knew too much. So my takeaway from that after afterwards, um, I really felt down and out, but on the other hand, I felt like he was threatened that I was going to take his job. Yeah, so like, like anytime someone tells you that you know too much, um, they're not being completely honest with you. So you dodged a bullet there because if they won't be honest with you in the interview process, they won't be honest with you when you work with them. So well, chin up on that one. I know it's not the results you wanted, uh, but, 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 but just know that's the reality. That's just such a bogus thing to say. And you're probably right. You might've been threatened. Who knows? So what's your, what's your question today? I I went for another interview and believe it or not, I'm on, this is why I'm nervous. Ken and really nervous, like almost to the point of crying, but I really trying to hold myself together because I'm a grown adult. Yeah. But after just listening to what you were saying about mental health and just financial despair, you know, and all of that in your job really affects you. And when I went for this company, which is a, a general contracting company, which is where my expertise lies. Mm-hmm. And um, in, and I, I, told somebody at your program that it was really shocking to me when I walked in, they had something that was Bible based and, and it was called the, uh, is Christianity Christ plus. And I just felt weird that it was there, but I took it and it it just meant a lot. I felt like I was connected with them. But the, the question I have is I'm going for my fourth interview. I've had two on the phone, one with HR and then an HR senior supervisor and then with the project manager okay. that I would be working with. And now on Wednesday at nine o'clock, I'm just really nervous because I have the fourth interview and yeah. I don't know how to like ask for the job without being aggressive. Well, okay. So this is your fourth interview. So the good news is, is you've done well on the other three to get invited to the fourth and you've already interviewed with some of these people or all. I've interviewed with the, the three t- people that I shared with you, but this one is with the, um, the COO. Yeah. The but my point is officer. you got three fans in there because they've at least put you to this level. They, they believe okay. that you're, that you're worth the next round of interviews. So you don't have to worry about asking for the job. They know you want the job because you showed up and when, and, okay. and, and, and what you have to do is, is just be excited and enthusiastic and grateful gratitude for the next shot. Uh, enthusiastic for the opportunity and answer their questions with enthusiasm and they'll get they know you want the job you know and and that's after the meeting after the meeting you can you can email everybody write a handwritten note say i am so grateful for this opportunity i would love this opportunity just know that i am i am i am thrilled and ready to go you can do that after the meeting but they know you're interested in the job so don't worry about that i i think you're just dealing with some classic nerves this is this is 
this is real. You know it's real. And you just yes, got to just repeat. It's not my first trip to the rodeo with this. So I that's know. Why I'm so nervous because oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I didn't say that right. Like I, I get to these second and third round of interviews, and then I, I just feel so excited. And I feel like I've got the job, and then I get, you know, right. my bubble burst. Well, but so, <laughs> so, this so is why I really want this time to go really well. And, and I, I want, want I want it to go well for you as as well. But you need to go into this thing going. I don't have this. And even if you feel like you crushed it, you walk out of there going, well, we'll see. You've got to change your mindset. You're in charge of your mind. And so what you got to go into this is hold it very loosely. Go, you know what? I'm excited about it, uh, but I'm not going to get my hopes up. And that's just maturity to say, uh, I'm going to protect my heart here. And, and I'm not going to quit. You know, it, it would be the same thing in love. You know, I wouldn't tell someone – who may have had a couple bad breakups or a divorce or whatever, and they get and they say, "Well, well, I'm afraid to put myself out there again," and I'd say, "Well, it's it's part of the deal, it's part of the deal." And you going through these job interviews and getting into these multiple rounds, and I would just reiterate everything you've done in the last rounds. I would rinse and repeat because it got you to this point. The COO hasn't been in the room, so the same answers, the same attitude. That's all you can do. Only thing you can control is is being honest and being enthusiastic and being grateful. Honest, enthusiastic, grateful. That's all you can control. And then we let the chips fall where they fall. And you're going to be okay. And you'll rise above it because you have before, if you have to, or you're going to get the gig. And don't think don't think about it anymore. And, and I get it. Uh, there's a lot on the line here. But all you can control is you showing up Doing the best you can, not trying to perform here, but just being your best, being honest, being enthusiastic, be grateful, and leave it at that, and you're going to be fine. I promise. Every time, because I believe that the right opportunity presents itself at the right time, and we have to go through several other opportunities. Think of it as a door. i got to walk through multiple doors to find out whether or not I'm in the right room. And that's where you are. I'm really proud of you, by the way. Um, I, I want to tell you, I'm proud of you for doing the work, for reading the books, for taking the assessment, for staying with it. And it, I hope this works. But if it doesn't, it's not a no, it's a not here, and it's a not now. And that's the attitude. We turn rejection into redirection until the right no's lead us to the right yes. And that worked for me. It'll work for you. This is The Ken Coleman Show. Press Thanks on. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.